it didn't take me long to figure out what video I'm making today. The chair I've been using daily inside the house, the Permobile C300, the seat elevator broke on it last night. And the forefront, I still need to get the programming sorted on that. That's a whole nother deal. Um, I got a halfway program before the programmer was removed from my clutches. So it wound up being left in a state of and not being able to use it very well. I'm trying to locate one on eBay right now, but they're they're so expensive. They're like 500 bucks. But anyways, I hopped into the steampunk chair as my backup. One of the routers for this complicated setup in this place is right up there. And I was using the sea elevator to get up there and plug in a cable and started going up. Then all of a sudden it stopped moving and the motor was turning really fast. So I think what happened was the belt slipped off the bottom of the seat elevator. At least I hope that's what happened. I mean, the belt could have broken also. This blue thing here is the beast in question. And you can see our seat is a little bit higher than normal. Yeah, we're, we're gonna take this thing apart. I don't know how many seat elevator videos I've done. Hopefully this one's different. I don't think it's gonna require a welder because I'm not gonna do that at this point. It's the single most difficult job you can do on a Permobile, at least the older style ones, like the M300, the C300s. You have to remove pretty much everything from the chair. I'm gonna have to take the seat pan off. I'm gonna have to get the Hoyer lift over here. We're gonna have to remove the seating from the power base, lift that up in the air. Usually you can get away with doing it without disconnecting all the wiring. And then you get all the shrouds and everything off. Then you can slide the seat elevator out flip the thing upside down and see the belt drive on the bottom. So that's what we're gonna do. Well, the steampunk chair here is pretty cool and all. Immediately after I sat down in it, I quickly realized that it makes my back hurt. This thing's a little bit better. The forefront would be ideal, but that's a little ways off again before I can use that daily, so. Time to shut up and get to doing some work. Step one, remove the seat pan. Uh, step two, these four giant bolts right here, um, I'm gonna take those loose, uh, just so that they're finger tight. Then we're gonna drag the Hoyer over here, strap the seat up to it, and then once those are loose and that thing is attached, we'll take them out the rest of the way and then lift the thing up in the air. Now that this thing is all wrapped up like some sort of weird present with a bunch of bows on it, uh, we can put a little bit of tension on the lift here. Looks like everything's pretty even. And now we'll go through here and remove these bolts the rest of the way. Try not to lose the washers. All right, now we'll get these. We'll get these all somewhere safe and out of the way. And at this point, the seating is now disconnected from the power base. So if we put a little more tension on this, our seating should lift right up. And not exactly balanced, so we can adjust this ratchet strap a little bit. Mmm, safety. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a bit wobbly. Now what I usually do here, since the right side's gonna be heavier because the joystick and everything, everything is over there, you can sort of fold down this armrest and jam it against the wire here and that'll sort of stabilize it from tipping back and forth too much. And it looks like we've got a decent amount of wire down there. So I'm gonna go ahead and continue lifting the thing up until we've got enough access to kind of get in there while I'm keeping an eye on the wire. Now you can see here we've got this wire that is going up to the seating and coming down here. That's about as high as we can lift it without it becoming an issue. So what we're gonna do now is remove all these plastics and then there's four bolts. There's two on each side here that we're gonna remove and then the whole seat lift uh, mechanism will come out of there. 
It's interesting to know. This one has sort of a uh, stabilizing adapter on it. I actually haven't seen that. This is a newer version of the C300, so, uh, I mean, yeah, maybe that's something different for some reason, but anyways, uh, I'm going to get all this stuff off of here. Well, it would seem as though our Hoyer lift is very slowly lowering itself, but I think we're all right. I, uh, I was able to cut one zip tie right here, and it gave us a lot more slack with these cables. So I was able to lift this way up and get a lot more space. The problem with these C300s and the M300s is they just stuff all the wiring for the seating and the ICS and everything down here in these little areas. So it can be a little bit tricky to get everything out of there and also get it back into place. I guess I have to cut that other zip tie there too. And the ICS is just Velcro in here, listen. They just use like an industrial Velcro. So I'm gonna get all that wiring pulled out of there and then I'm just gonna go ahead and rip that lift out and I'll, we'll see what's going on. I tried not to disturb that wiring too much. I just sort of left it in a big bundle and pulled the whole thing out of there. This side is the seat elevator control module and this fuse for the whole chair is kind of in the way so you can't really get this thing out of here. What I'm gonna do is all the bolts are out now. I'm just gonna slowly lift that up while I'm keeping an eye on these wires. And in theory, with this unplugged, most of that should be able to stay in there. But uh, let's see here. Should probably take off my watch for this. Okay, so we're just gonna grab this and kind of carefully pull it out of here. Yeah, you can see that our uh, bundle of wiring just kind of hanging off of here. All right, let's look at the bottom. Will there be a belt? Oh, there is a belt. That's weird. Wow, this unit is in pristine condition, wow. So, I just assumed, oh, that's the other thing too I mentioned before. There's all these little um, black clips that go on here. I usually just like to pull those off and keep them all in one spot. Looks like we're missing one already. It's probably still down inside the chair, but those keep everything from rattling. But yeah, it looks like we're still connected. I shouldn't be able to turn this by hand, so I would put money on this coupler right here, not uh, being connected to the motor right now. Yeah, so I can turn this and the motor's not turning. So that means, yeah, if you look way down in here, see how there's a kind of a keyed flat spot right there? So this coupler I believe has shifted down and it's still connected to this, but it's not staying attached to that. Not 100% sure what holds that in place. Kind of looks like glue, but um, yeah, that's very clearly shifted. Oh, wait. Oh yeah, it's still turning. Let's look at the bottom here. Yeah, it doesn't look like our output shaft is moving, so that looks fine. So I think it's just uh, purely this coupler. Let me grab a hammer. Let's give this a little tappy tap tap and see if it moves. Although, you gotta align this so that the keyway is exactly right. So what I'm doing here, right, I'm gonna look right down in this area. And as I spin the shaft, it's really hard to see here. Let's see if I can brighten that up. There we go. Uh, I'm going to rotate this shaft until I can see the flat spot on uh, on this little coupler down here. Hopefully it hasn't rounded out. I'm just going to try and rotate this by hand and keep an eye on that and see if we can find where it lines up. You know what? That might have rounded out. Um... There we go, it moved. So what I did there, it was off camera, but I was rotating this by hand while I was tapping on it with a hammer. See that line there? The thing shifted up and now it's re-engaged. So if we tap this a little more, there we go. Now you can see it is fully engaged and now I can't rotate this by hand because it is engaged with the motor and you can't rotate this motor by hand. So now the question is, what made this break? And how does this all hold together? 
because there are no locking mechanisms on this that hold it in place. I got that butted up about as far as it'll go because I want as much engagement on that as possible. It looks like our belt is okay. Um, if you look real close, you can see it's just barely sliding off the end of this gear, but this, uh, this sprocket here has sort of a lip on it. There we go, you can see that lip, and that keeps the belt aligned. So even though this is just barely sticking off, I'm gonna say it's fine and we don't need to worry about alignment, and the tension seems good. I can barely deflect that by hand. So I'm gonna look at this a little more and see if there isn't an easy way. I can put some sort of retention clip on there to keep that lined up, because that thing clearly slid down. You can see the amount of movement that we had there. That's why being really perceptive when you're looking at this stuff makes all the difference in the world. You can see you can see the grease marks there, so you know it's moved that much. I mean, same when you're taking apart other stuff and trying to figure out how it goes back together. All you do is look for scratch marks and things like that, where it looks like screws have been and uh, other surfaces have made it together. So I think uh, I think maybe a hose clamp around this shaft might be a good way to deal with that. I might actually have some little uh, collar, shaft collar couplers too that I could put on there. Uh, I'm gonna dig through the stockpile and see what I've got laying around. Go wash up my hands, refill the coffee, all that stuff. And I'll let you know what I come up with. Sidebar, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel here, let's take a look at another one of these things and um, see how they attached it on this one. Because it seems weird to me that they would just have nothing holding it together. Oh. Which is exactly what they're using. Nothing. You can even see the uh, the marks and the filth here that show that it slid up and down a little bit. Um, so apparently they're just relying on hopes and dreams to keep these things together. That's interesting. Luckily, I keep a stock of little hose clamps, I think. Oh, yep, here they are. So inside this magical treasure chest, we have some old uh, JB Weld and some of these things. These are a little bit large in diameter, so... The tail might stick out a little bit, but that's okay. I think what I'm going to do is clamp this on there, and then I'll just trim off the little tail that's sticking out. That way it doesn't interfere with anything. And supposedly, if I have a flat blade. There we go. Supposedly we can get this tight enough. If Promobile thinks it's fine to rely on the frictal forces of a Delrun sleeve on a metal shaft with no support whatsoever, it's not going to take much. To hold it in place. And apparently it moved on this one, so I think this will do it. Now that I'm looking at this, there doesn't seem to be that much clearance. So we're going to plug this thing into the chair real quick and uh, just verify as it's moving that we will have clearance because I'm pretty sure that's going to collide. So let's plug this thing in here. Power up the chair, and activate our seat lift. Oh, it just clears, look at that. Whee, look at it go. Well, you could get out the feeler gauge to check the clearance on that, but it's clearly fine. Huh, well, like someone I know used to always say, good enough for who it's for. I do believe we're ready for reassembly. Now these little plastic caps, like I was saying, are fairly important. They they keep this whole mechanism from rattling around, but as you can see, they like to split and break a lot. So I'm just gonna push these on here and then use a little bit of electrical tape to hold them in place. That'll give them a little more cushioning and whatnot while they're down inside there. If you don't have these on there, then you have metal on metal contact inside the chair and uh, it starts to kinda I'll make a bunch of noise and start scraping on things and it's good not to have 
metal parts sitting on each other vibrating constantly. Beautiful. There we go. Pro Street. That's better than stock. <laughs> well, it's something anyways. Oh, yeah, so you can see here on this side, this is where that ICS box goes. And they have this super industrial Velcro that holds everything in there. But all right, I'm going to load this thing back in there and then we're ready to reassemble. Look at that tap dancing. <laughs> Come on. There we go. Ah, gotta love damaged nervous systems. Yeah, only sprung a minor leak and that was just from some sharp zip ties. But we've got all our wiring jammed down in here. So now we're gonna lift the seat elevator up to make the mating process a little bit easier. And yeah, we'll be good. Now I temporarily robbed the uh, front cover screws off of this uh, blue chair to put on the steampunk chair while I was using it part of yesterday and last night. Um, I've got another set of them over here. I just figured it was easier since I'd be taking the cover off anyways to just stick them on this thing. So we'll just screw these back on here now and we are going to be done. And there we go. One C300 with a now much more functional seat elevator and uh, it can be my daily. It's kind of my backup. And I guess the steampunk is my backup backup chair. Um, yeah. Hey, it's me from the future real quick. Two things I forgot to mention. One, I should have checked the welds on the bottom of that seat elevator mechanism before putting it back together, just to make sure they weren't starting to crack because usually it takes a while for it to actually break free. And if I'd inspected it, I could have seen that. Although realistically, I probably would have put it back together anyways because I don't feel like welding stuff right now. But two, super important, if your seat elevator quits working on a chair like this, don't keep activating the motor. The more you run it, the more damage it can cause. If the belt had fallen off and it was just sitting in the bottom, there's a good chance that that motor spinning could have grabbed that belt and shredded it when it could have otherwise just been put back on and adjusted properly. But in my case, that coupler being screwed up, if I'd kept uh, spinning that motor, it would have just ground a big hole in that coupler and then potentially would have made it so it wasn't fixable and I would have had to replace that part. So if something breaks, I mean, you can try it real quick just to see if anything's moving, but after that, stop trying to use it if it's not working. It'll make repairs a lot easier later on, potentially. I'd say like 90% of the time. It's not always like, the most ideal thing in the world using a bunch of like old junky wheelchairs because like things are always break and whatnot so while i may have a garage full of wheelchairs it takes a garage full of wheelchairs to make one or two of them function on a daily basis um and i'm gonna be tired tomorrow this was kind of a lot of work i didn't have to get onto the floor which was nice but it was a lot of leaning over and whatnot, so. Also, this is the same chair I had to repair the joystick on a couple of times. This one had that connector inside of it where the joystick gimbal became disconnected because there was no glue or anything holding the connector in place. And then again, later on, as you can see, we have this yellow cable here. I had to replace the pigtail coming out of the joystick because with the swing away, it eventually kind of wore through. I'm just noticing here that this joint's a little bit tight and is smashing on that wire pretty good. So I might replace that zip tie to give it some strain relief. You can kind of see, if you look closely there, 
the wire is sort of mashed out in all directions and that's not uh that's not best for the life of these things oh and also this is the same chair as well that i swapped the f3 motors into and i had to put the slots in the top of the cover so i could reach in here and get to the brakes because the c300s normally the brake lever comes out right here and the motors are much smaller but if you notice inside this area where the brake release used to be is all filled with motor now same thing i did on this chair f3 motor swap because the c300s were a max of five miles an hour they're not the safest chair in the world and taking them up to 6.5 isn't eh, necessarily the best thing but the main issue was the range these f3 motors are much more efficient than those five mile an hour ones were so it almost doubled the range of the chair not that i run around outside in c300s at all because they're constantly trying to tip over and throw you on the ground but it's nice to be able to just at least make it through a day of running around and you know in the van and to the grocery store and whatever without having to worry about it going dead but anyways yeah i think we'll call that good